Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to this uh, important uh, morning meeting. Breakfast without food, maybe, uh, or at least a morning meeting. I think um, you all had breakfast, hopefully, before this, uh, at least a cup of coffee. Some of you I was together with last night, too, at uh, uh, dinner uh, on uh, nature and climate. Uh, we're not going to spend this morning uh, talking about why we have to take better care of nature and climate. I think we know no why. I, I think the situation is not that great. Uh, our planet uh, is getting warmer and we also know that land is degrading and we also know that uh, we are in a situation where we're losing biodiversity. So. This has not to be about um, why, but about how. And you know that the World Economic Forum asked the International Organization for Public-Private uh, Cooperation. Uh, we also tried to mobilize the private sector uh, for nature and climate. Nature positive, and uh, we also uh, want a net zero situation over time when it comes to climate. It's now how are we going to uh, meet those uh, aspirations. Uh, and we have taken many initiatives. I think you are aware of some of them. We have CO Climate Leaders, 130 companies that have committed to go net zero by 2050, started in 2013. We also have the First Movers Coalition, 88 companies that have committed to use their purchasing power to create a green market, use their procurement uh, kind of leverage to change. So I could make this list even longer, one trillion trees. Maybe some of you also have heard about. What we're trying to do today is to add to the public-private a third P, philanthropy. And uh, philanthropy can catalyze uh, a lot of new initiatives. And if you think about it also, that it can also be a way of mobilizing billions that again can mobilize trillions. Sometimes you really need seed capital, seed money. And today philanthropy is playing an increasingly important role in many aspects. Not so much though, unfortunately, when it comes to climate and nature. Only 2% of what is um, committed in philanthropy annually goes to climate. And less than 2% to nature. That's less than 4%. So 96% goes to other very important purposes. And, uh, but I think we can do more uh, in the field um, of uh, nature and climate since it's an existential question for not uh, only uh, our children and grandchildren anymore, it is uh, all these things are happening here and now. That's why we launched under the leadership of my colleague, Gim Wei, I think you're somewhere here, uh, and a great team at the forum, uh, this Gaia Initiative. The Gaia Initiative is not only our planet, but it's also really a collaboration to amplify what pledging in philanthropy means for the planet. And uh, for me, this is a new initiative that uh, we launched in Davos. We're following up now also in summer Davos that is very consequential. So I'm so happy that we have this group uh, here today. Uh, that will uh, discuss this and we know also there's a huge opportunity to unlock more philanthropy in these areas in Asia. Uh, philanthropy and private offices are growing very fast in this region and I know there are leaders that really care about both philanthropy, climate and nature in this region. So I think this can uh, mean a big difference. So I'm very proud that uh, we are heading this Gaia initiative and I'm also very proud uh, that my colleagues at the World Economic Forum has been pushing through this uh, and uh, just in less than a year it's caught so much momentum. 
the fact that we are here proves that. So I think I'm now supposed to land. That's also important uh, because we have a great panel and we also have a great moderator. So I'm going to go and chair another panel about uh, the geopolitics of the world, maybe almost as challenging uh, as uh, climate and nature, and maybe they're interconnected. I think it would be a good thing if, uh, for example, the G2 could agree um, on uh, really important um, measures, both on climate and nature. But that's a different story. So thank you very much, and good luck with the panel. Good luck. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see you all. Um, thank you, Borge, for setting the agenda. Uh, very rightly said that this panel is uh, about the how uh, of climate change, so actionable. Um, but before I get straight into introducing our brilliant panelists, um, I want a quick note for the audience. Please engage with us. Um, if, you're, if you're tweeting, if you're engaging with us, watching us live, use hashtag AMNC23. And towards the end, we'll keep the last 15 minutes for questions and answers. So it's a good time to start thinking about your questions, make a note. Uh, and when we open the floor, please be ready with your questions. So let me go straight into introducing our panelists. Um, to my left is Majun. Uh, you wear many hats. Uh, you're the chairman of Green Finance Committee, uh, China Society for Finance and Banking. You're also the founder and president of Institute of Finance and Sustainability and former co-chair of G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group and co-chair of Steerco of Green Investment Principles for Belt and Road. And you're also a professor. Um, so uh, Dr. Ma, looking forward to hearing your views. Um, to the left of uh, Dr. Ma is uh, Siokoi Lim, CEO of Philanthropy Asia Alliance. Um, and we'll talk more about um, how you're involved with uh, Temasek Trust and the report as well later on. Um, to your left is Joseph Luke Engai, chairman for Greater China, McKinsey and Company. Uh, welcome to the forum. Um, to Joseph's left is Sabrina Peng, Chief Sustainability Officer and Group. Uh, and to Sabrina's left and my right is His Excellency Pea Mushalenga, Minister of Information and Technology, Government of Namibia. Welcome to the forum. Um, quick introduction from me. Uh, my name is Spriha Shravastav. I am uh, a journalist. I work with Business Insider, Insider, as you can see the logos. I'm the UK Bureau Chief. I've uh, been a journalist for about 15 years or so. So let's get straight to the point. The topic today is innovating for the planet. You all wear different hats. You all will be looking at this topic from very different lenses. So I want to go straight to the question of what does planet innovation mean to you? And I want to start with you, Dr. Ma. Thank you very much. You hear me OK, right? Um, it's really great to be part of this uh, discussion. And I'd like to talk about this from the finance angle, since I've been working in the finance field for 30 years. Uh, and uh, I spent most of the past 10 years working on green finance and simple finance, both in China and globally. Um, in fact, 10 years ago, uh, when we were in China discussing uh, the need for green financing, the focus was on pollution. Uh, some of you in Beijing, you may know that uh, in one day in Beijing 2013, the PM 2.5 went up to 1,000. Um, you know, most of you no PM 2.5, some of you probably don't know, it's a measure of the uh, uh, density of air pollutants uh, in cubic meter of air. And uh, it's like uh, you know, 50 times higher than safe level. So that's a time when we started thinking about green financing. We need to put in a lot of money fixing you know, air pollution, water pollution, land contamination. 2014, when I joined the central bank, the PBOC, um, we estimated that uh, we need like a four trillion RMB per year for treating the uh, pollution problem. And then later on, we created this green financial system in China, uh, including in 2016, um, we had this uh, green finance guideline, which I helped put together in China. So since then, uh, really green finance exploded in China. We started with a couple of trillion RMB uh, back 10 years ago. Now it's 25 trillion RMB outstanding green loans. Um, and China is now becoming by far the largest green lending market. And also, in 2016, we created this green bond market. We are now the second largest green bond market. And we have 1,000 green funds, which are really equity investments into green projects. Um, so the starting point is pollution. And last few years, uh, it came to climate change, because our president committed to you know, uh, 2060 carbon neutrality. 
And then we estimated how much money we need. It's uh, 16 trillion RMB per year. It's no longer four, it's 16. And we need uh, you know, much more money than before to deal with uh, uh, climate you know, included uh, sustainability agenda. And so far, I think uh, uh, we probably only meet half of that demand from the uh, financial sector and the other half are still sort of missing. And we need to build a more complete, more efficient green financial system to mobilize private capital, including from the banking system, asset managers, insurance, and so on. Uh, the four pillars that we constructed in the green financial system, which are still evolving, are number one, we need standards. We need clear definition of what green activities are, otherwise it will be greenwashing. Number two, we need the reporting standards so that uh, the issuers or the fundraisers will tell the market, uh, you know, the banks and asset managers what exactly we are doing in terms of delivering <coughs> environmental benefits. Tell us how much carbon you are reducing. And thirdly, we need a whole range of uh, financial products to meet uh, diverse uh, you know, demands from different kinds of green activities, renewables, um, you know, solid waste, electric vehicles, batteries, decarbonization of steels, they all require different kind of financing package and financing products. And finally, we have to put together a set of incentives to make a lot of these green projects or transition projects bankable. A lot of these projects are not bankable for the moment. They look good. You know, they generate environmental benefits. They're not profit making. That's why private sector are not willing to join. But we need to create incentives so that in the first few years, they become bankable. And when private sector come into the sector and they become large enough, they'll be bankable by themselves. The good examples are China and now the largest renewable investor, largest EV investor and exporter, largest battery um, you know, producers and exporter. So all these are successful stories of the past incentive that we're putting, and now they become mature and they can do even you know, without subsidies. Globally, the same thing. And I think annually we need a 4.5 trillion US dollar for climate action. Um, of course, China being part of it. And the financing is becoming even more challenging because a lot of developing country emerging markets still doesn't have their green financial system in place. They need taxonomy, they need the disclosure, they need the products, they need incentives. And I think one of the efforts we should be making is to help um, you know, many other developing country emerging market economies to build their green financial system going forward. That's great. I will come back to you on the 16 trillion uh, point, but I want to go to COK first. Can you, what, what, what does uh, planet innovation mean to you? Well, um, I'd like to talk a bit about the Philanthropy Asia Alliance. Um, this is an alliance that was announced uh, last September at the Philanthropy Asia Summit in Singapore. So that was our soft launch. Our formal launch is this September at the next edition of the summit. Um, what the alliance is, is a a coalition for change. So it is a group of donors, our members, of program partners, and of knowledge experts. And the idea really is to catalyze multi-sector partnerships by leveraging the pooled resources, expertise, and capabilities from all of these people, our entire community of members, to come together as a force for good, to tackle urgent climate and um, other humanity challenges it, with Asia as a focus. So global alliance, Asian focus. And to kick things off, we had um, Tomasic Trust uh, coming in as, an, as a member together with others such as the Gates Foundation, the Dalio Philanthropies, Ray Dalio, Lee Kashing Foundation and others. So it is really the global philanthropies, philanthropists, family offices, foundations, corporates coming together to provide the funds for action, collaboration for action, along with our program partners to execute. Our three anchor mandates are climate and nature as well as education and health, because there are many intersections with across these mandates. Um, our, our mission really is the four Ps, planet, people, peace, and progress, underpinned by the fifth P of partnerships. And really, as, as uh, Dr. Ma was saying, um, where the private sector is unwilling or unable to step in yet, that's where philanthropy, the small but mighty P, can come in to catalyze, to provide the catalytic first loss capital that's required to test solutions, solutions that aren't bankable yet. And that's where philanthropy can come in to then test them. And once they become bankable and investable, then you can crowd in funding from the public and private sectors. And, um, and why Asia? Um, because this is a great time. On the one hand, if you look at the sheer scale and development profile of Asia, we have 60% of the world's population. We have nearly half of global GDP residing in Asia. 
And you know, I've read that in the next few years or so, five trillion dollars of wealth is going to pass from uh, the current generation of wealth holders to the next generation. So there's tremendous opportunity and challenges. On the, one, on the other hand, Asia is responsible for about half of global carbon emissions. So if we can harness all this collective resolve to come together as a force for good, we can go a long way. Asia can go a long way to solving global challenges. Thank you. Joseph. Well, first of all, I, I, I love the fact that we're bringing philanthropy into the discussion. Right? I do think that we need more innovation right, in this area because I think in the past, I think that people are too focus on trade-offs, right? It's either sustainability or it's growth or it's emerging markets or it's going to be you know, the, the trade-off between developed markets. And I think that the power, um, and we've been talking a little bit around the power of and, right? The world needs growth. The world needs sustainability. The world also needs inclusion. And somehow you've got to put these all together because when we're too siloed in our own thinking, what happens if we talk past each other? So I do think that innovation um, you know, is very important because we need to bring a little bit more of this joint um, aspiration and community together, right? Otherwise, I think that we'll always be into our own little conferences and silos and nothing will ever get done. And I love the fact that we're now bringing public, private, philanthropic, right? And, and partnership together. These are the four Ps with your five Ps, right? I think that it will really work because I do think that now maybe there needs to be a more, you know, cross-boundary, cross um, discipline, um, convener, right? And maybe philanthropic forces can be part of that uh, initiative, right? But I do think that if I think about the more short-term challenges, um, I come back to China when you're sitting here, right? We are now, you know, um, you know, 50%, you know, of actually renewable capacity, right? Where at this stage, you know, some of the world's leading, you know, whether it's EVs or whether, you know, I think the opportunity is massive. But on the other hand, um, I think if I, the short-term, you know, you know, uh, force on the corporates right now is margin compression, trying to survive, um, trying to figure out like, you know, what the next few years are, right? And I think that we gotta somehow bring together all these forces at work and think about like, what's the agenda and how do we use innovation to perhaps bring back a little bit more the action and less of a talk, right, into the equation. Yeah, that's very interesting. Sabrina, you're a Chief Sustainability Officer. Uh, what's your take? Well, how do you view Planet Innovation? So first of all, today, I think bring the philanthropy part into this PPP, I think it's a great idea. And, uh, but I also want to add another P, maybe the fourth P, people. Because uh, Ange actually owns Alipay. Alipay is one of the most popular lifestyle APP in China. Almost everyone in China, they have Alipay APP, using that for payment, for utility bills paying, for taking taxi, for shopping, for everything. So six years ago, we come up with the idea how to engage all the audience, all the people, users. They really get awareness of the environment, of the planet, and also change the awareness to real actions. Because I think a lot of people, they have the awareness but huge gap between the awareness to real actions. So because we have the platform of the user socialization, so we invented a mini app called Ant Forest. So actually, basically, it's encouraging everybody to take green actions every day. Like, like you take public transportation instead of driving your own cars, or you go to a grocery store, you do not ask for a plastic bag. You carry your own bag, etc. A lot of activities every day. We're happy to see after six years more than 650 million users. They participate in this. I think this is a huge angle for the people side to join this PPP. So another P. <laughs> so because I, I think this is a huge power from the normal people side. They are participate in this big plan. That will be the real innovation, yeah, in my understanding. That's great, adding another P, people. That's very interesting. <laughs> Minister, you represent the government. You're from the government. When you hear these views, what, what do you think? What does planet innovation mean to you? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, at this time in point, yeah, planet in, in, innovation uh, include quite a number of areas, a number of sectors, and a number of 
industries to start with. Uh, but more importantly, is to start with our people, particularly the young generation, <coughs> who are the future. For them to understand planet invasion, first we must start with public education among our youth. We start with education, making it part of the school curriculum, particularly at the secondary school level. A number of schools are adopting programs whereby they bring to the awareness of the learners the importance of issues like climate change. Now, when they are trained, for example, to become entrepreneurs, then they should now start looking at the new innovations in terms of supply chain, for example, what are the new innovations that are required? Whether in terms of incremental innovation to build on what they are currently having, whether in terms of disruptive innovation to start changing new way of doing things in order to trade. Now, there, there is where we should now put our money. Philanthropists should come in, putting in money in these programs that are aimed at orienting our youth towards shaping the way of doing businesses for the better future. Very interesting. So some really interesting themes emerging here. I can see public education need to invest more. People, we need to bring people in. Working in silos. Um, and you know, going back to you, what you said about this gap as well, the 16 trillion RMB that's needed. I think the end goal here is to achieve planetary targets. Um, and there are a lot of innovation that's happening. There is so much money going into climate tech. But that, is that a drop in the ocean? Um, is there more to be done? Is there more innovation? And when you talk about this gap, do you think there is a role that philanthropy can play in, in sort of plugging that gap? So I want to start with you. Uh, definitely. In China, when we started thinking about green finance, we were talking about uh, uh, the financial sector, private sector. We have to mobilize 90% of the green money. And the government only account for about 10%. And now it's the same thing. I think for most countries, uh, for climate, for nature, only 10% can be uh, really mobilized within the government budgetary system, and the rest have to come from private sector. But private sector, the majority of them are actually money sort of oriented. Um, they need to look for profits, and at least for the banks, right? They need to get the principal back. So uh, there's a lot of barriers you know, to their entry into the uh, green space, especially in early stage of a lot of these green projects. Uh, that's why I think incentives are important. And uh, early on, I mentioned a couple of sort of government uh, incentives. In China, we have the central bank putting a facility, it's called decarbonization facility, that offers a funding cost of only 1.75%, which is much lower than market. So that's sort of an inducement to the banks, commercial banks, to participate. Right? It's like blended financing. I give you cheap money, and uh, you do it jointly uh, with me. Um, and the local governments in China are also doing this, using their fiscal money to subsidize the green loans and to guarantee green loans to de-risk uh, these projects. And it's been doing very well in one of the places uh, in China called Huzhou. It's one of the pilot regions for green finance. They were doing this for the past six years. Every year, they could generate 40% growth on average uh, green financing and really contributing you know, massively to the uh, development of the green economy. Now, how do we bring philanthropy into this space? I think philanthropy can mimic the government uh, in offering such incentives. For example, de-risking. Right? If you offer, um, you know, whether it's partial or full, uh, you know, loss guarantee, then you can crowd in probably 50 times, even 100 times of private sector money. And the second thing you can do is to subsidize uh, uh, the additional cost of uh, being recognized as a green. For example, uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, the government actually subsidized the green verification of green bonds. It's a small amount of money, but it actually induces a lot of more money. I think leverage could be 100 times. Uh, Singapore probably doing the same thing, right? A couple of places are doing that. 
And uh, I'm, I'm sure philanthropy can do very much the same thing uh, to you know, leverage and crowding a much bigger you know, size of private sector money. The other thing I think uh, uh, philanthropy probably can play an even bigger role is capacity building. As I mentioned earlier, we need a lot of capacity in developing country emerging markets to turn their green financial system, their financial system into a greener one. And uh, uh, that capacity requires uh, you know, training, for example, government officials, regulators, uh, the banks, asset managers, the third party service providers such as verifiers. And uh, this training um, you know, takes up maybe only 0.1% of the entire sustainable finance budget. But it's so critical because without people, you cannot implement it. Uh, Mark Carney used to say, hey, let's mobilize one trillion US dollar for climate action in emerging markets. Then my question is that, where do we get this uh, 10,000 people to implement these projects? That's really the bottleneck. So a small amount of money, you know, a few million dollars training maybe you know, 100,000 people in emerging markets will be the key uh, really to break this bottleneck. And the philanthropy can do that in a big way. Yep. Joseph, do you want to jump in on sure. that? Sure. Look, you know, I think you know, the gap in terms of you know, the financing gap is such, so large that you know, I don't think that philanthropy will, will plug that gap right, in terms of the raw amount of money. But I think what you know, philanthropic organizations should really think about is their unique positioning in this whole equation. Right? If I think about what they can do um, and it's unique, I think the first one I think is the convening power. Right? I, I do think that right now, um, and p pulling in the P from philanthropic into the equation, I think can convene across you know, na national lines, they can convene across you know, um, corporate lines, they can feed across uh, different domains. And I do think that that convening power, that platform, is actually very important. The second one, I think, is as an accelerator, right, as uh, Dr. Ma just said, I think that there are certain things that maybe everyone can afford that million, do few million, but being a lot more focused and being the first one to spot the opportunity, um, being more passionate, more mission-driven, I think that there's an accelerator effect that philanthropic organizations can actually do. And then I think the last one is really around inspiration, right? I think for a lot of corporates, right, they are right now, you know, so, um, you know, again, into their own world of, you know, survival and margins and everything else, is that I think we need someone to provide that extra inspiration that, you know, helps us to, you know, think more positively, right, about many things in the world. And I think that federal organizations, in many ways, right, can provide that spark, that little inspiration for all of us to follow, right? At the end, the money, will have to come from corporates. It has to be somehow uh, make sense financially. Otherwise, that gap will forever be there, right? But I think that you need that spark, you need that accelerator, uh, you need that convening. And I think that's what philanthropic organizations can really help us here. That's a very interesting point because we, we don't think the philanthropic organizations can replace private capital, but they kind of will bring in that extra bit of altruism, really. That, that's so, sort of what we need. And Siokwe, I would want to sort of lean on you here. What, what's your take on this? Exactly right. I, I like the point about inspiration and that spark. Because just to give an example, Tomasic Foundation uh, is with, within our Tomasic Trust ecosystem has got this livability challenge prize. It's a global call. Um, with a $1 million seed funding for a winner. It's to draw out the climate tech startups, but that's not enough. Okay, first of all, they need that money to kick things off, to pilot solutions, to make them bankable. But we also bring in, through the network, to your point on corporates have the real money, to then put in additional follow-on funding. And so one example of this is in 2021, the winner that year, um, it's formerly called Sea Change, now it's called Equatic Tech, really it came up with a solution to capture carbon dioxide from seawater. And, you know, the ocean's a great sponge. In fact, 150 times more efficient than land. So once you do that, it reabsorbs, etc. And the carbon dioxide captured became then carbonates for construction material. So that's great. And then because of this, where did the government, that public P, come in? Um, it came in to provide additional funding to trial a solution for desalination of seawater. So that's one great example of the PPPs, the public, private, philanthropic sectors, coming together. To, to scale for greater impact. Yeah. Minister, do you see any pushback from the government on, on, on philanthropy sort of making its way into helping um, you know, achieve our targets? Uh, well, as I said, my focus is really on uh, imparting knowledge on people. Uh, for me, uh, philanthropists should come in now in terms of funding 
higher education, research, and technology. A lot of our institutions of higher learning are undergoing transformation from being traditional academic institutions in order to align themselves to emerging technologies, emerging challenges of climate change and so forth. We have programs, for example, like the green hydrogens that are coming. Do we have programs at our institutions of higher learning that equip students well in order to position themselves, in order to develop these types of projects? Not only to talk of people coming from developed countries, coming to developing countries to develop this, but to capacitate people in developing countries in terms of skills and knowledge. We need to fund research programs that are aimed at ensuring sustainable development. And that is where philanthropists are coming in in order to ensure that these new innovations that we are coming up with, we have people that are well equipped to sustain them. Sabrina, I want to get to you now. You mentioned a very interesting point about bringing people in, the, the, the fourth P, really. Um, do you see instances of that across the world when you, look at, when you look at examples? Do you have examples where you can sort of bring to the table and say, this is exactly where you know, the trendsetter is and would like to go this way? Um, with, you know, how, how do you bring people into the equation? OK, so let me explain a little bit more about Ant Forest then everybody get a sense of how to, uh, you know, we use a platform to engage people. And also, we're happy to see this model not only in China, but also just inspired by us. And uh, a lot of our partners, they're outside of China, they're doing this. So, so uh, the idea, so it's engage uh, users for their daily green actions. But the key here is how to really incentivize them. Okay, maybe today I won't do this, but tomorrow I'm busy, I don't want to do this, okay? So you need to incentivize people. So we come up with this mechanism, just uh, we make every action can count. So like you take a bus, we give you 80 gram uh, green energy. This actually based on the carbon emissions you saved compared to driving your own cars or the, the average. So actually, every action, we have a certain amount of green energy. This gives people a very just a real, tangible feeling. OK, this is really valuable for the nature. And the second is we use this green energy point. Actually, you can like play a game in our APP. We call it gamification way because people all love games, right? So they use this green energy point, they can plant a virtual tree. Once a virtual tree planted, we will donate money to the philanthropy partners, and they will plant a real tree in the desertification areas in China. Nowadays, 400 million trees has been planted already. So you can see the huge power from everybody they're gathering together, but they're very important part here is how to incentivize them doing this daily and continually to be a really sustainable you know, way to engage a lot of people to do this. So this is like, so the, the, this, the, the one side is people, the other side is corporate put fund in this and the philanthropy partners, they are they are helping with planting trees in a very professional way, scientific way. And also, because a lot of trees, they are planted in the country-owned, state-owned uh, the, the forest. So need a lot of su support from the public sector. So all these four parts play together, make this happen. Not only people, not only ant, not only just the finance people, and also the government. The four sectors, they play together. So I think this is um, very like uh, encouraging uh, examples for us. Yeah, that's why just, uh, you know, uh, I think the past uh, only last year uh, for our foundations we put here, uh, we have uh, actually we have two foundations from and alone. So the, the money we spend is more than 
110 million US dollars. Why? We are not doing this for business, because business, this is the philanthropy side. Why we are keeping doing this? Because the passion, the enthusiasm from the people and from all partners. And also I think this can definitely happen not only in China, all over the world. Because in Philippines, our partners, they inspired by this idea, they launch a Philippine and forest too. And because there they need a lot of trees planting, and we are so happy to see more and more partners. They like this idea. I think just not only just the, the uh, like the, the, the platform business, they can do this. Even a lot of consumer brands, they can do this too. Like we partner with uh, IHG, uh, uh, the hotel group. They encourage everybody when they check in the hotel, they do not use one-time use brush, teeth brush. A lot of things they can get the incentive. So, so this is the same idea. I think all the consumer brands can work together to just uh, influence their users. And this means a lot because they are the end. They are buying everything. They tell the brands and up all the industries to where to go, where is the right way to go. I think that um, Ackman go to like everybody work together. That's very interesting. And uh, yeah, sure, please do, please do. for Sabrina. You know, your um, idea of uh, and forestry really uh, inspired a lot of people and, and a lot of other activities. One problem that we discussed in Mongolia um, just uh, last week uh, when I was hosting a green finance capacity building event there, and we discussed with the president of Mongolia is that they want to um, plant one billion tree. And they asked me you know, how to raise money uh, <clears throat> for the uh, uh, one billion tree. You know, maybe you have an idea. You know, philanthropy, uh, you know, can, can, can they play a role in helping Mongolia, which will help China eventually, because yeah. the sandstone, you know, the Beijing experience is probably related to the desertification in Mongolia, right? Definitely can do so. And also uh, another, <clears throat> another thing I think is very important is uh, technology. Because when we are planting trees in Inner Mongolia, we found they are planting the trees the way like 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, because a little not of labor, but actually the, the environment is so complicated. Actually, I think technology can really play a very you know, big role there and also can share that technology, not only the fund, and also the way of doing that in a good way, in a sustainable way. Yeah. You've taken my job. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, this is what we want, right? We want the how. That's exactly what Borgate said earlier, that we want the how of um, climate uh, you know, innovation. How do we go forward? And how do we translate some of the conversations we've had to cross-border now? How do we take it globally? And this is the question, open question for the panel. Uh, we've been talking a lot about what we've been doing in specific countries, in the region itself, so you know, uh, Asia, uh, uh, Americas and Europe, how do we make it more global? Um, so any ideas, any uh, examples, uh, what's stopping us really? So open question for the panel, whoever wants to jump in. Can I start? Yeah, go for it. With, um, well, I'd like to talk about Gaia, giving to Amplify Earth Action, and a wonderful initiative announced by our friends uh, at, at the forum. Um, and really, you know, we are very proud and very privileged to have been the first Asian partner to sign up um, when it was announced. Um, in Davos earlier this year. It's really about harnessing the PPPs, more peace in the soup, um, public, private, philanthropic um, sectors to come together and see what, identify the gaps and the challenges and find opportunities there to work together through lighthouse projects. So what we're doing as our first deliverable as part of this Gaia initiative is to come up with a climate philanthropy report for Asia. Because to Borges' earlier point about less than 2%, of total philanthropic giving going towards climate. And actually of that, about less than 10% is from Asia. So really we need to up those numbers. What we found in doing, so it's a, it's a three track approach for this report. We are looking at the quantitative, the data, um, the qualitative, we're doing interviews, and then uh, case studies to showcase um, the success stories. So um, what we're finding though is that it's a fragmented landscape. So we need collaboration. Why? Because people don't know who else is addressing uh, these issues and what issues other people are working on. So there needs to be more sharing of work and learnings. 
So we need collaboration, that's the first thing. But it's also come across quite clearly that there's a lack of a talent pipeline in this area. So there's opportunities for cap capacity and capability building there. And really, there needs to be more active information exchanges. And then the third and last point that we've seen is that we need to translate all this talk, all the science, into an action, right? Into an action-oriented approach, communicate that globally to partners so that we, have, we allow easy adoption and then we can scale globally that way. Yeah. Anyone else wants to can jump? I say yeah. a few words on this uh, fragmentation of a sustainable finance markets. Uh, um, when I was co-chairing the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, we spent a lot of time discussing how to promote cross-border green capital flows, uh, especially you know, raising money from more developed markets to low-income countries for climate actions and uh, for supporting mm -hmm. nature. There are two major problems now that's really uh, sort of uh, limiting or blocking uh, the cross-border flows. Number one is the lack of uh, consistent definition of green activities. There's so many countries, so many NGOs, so many institutions, they're developing their own definitions, we call taxonomy. So China has a set of green taxonomy, Europe has a set of green taxonomy. I think 30 countries have their own taxonomy defining what green is. And uh, then a lot of uh, you know, companies defining their own green criteria. Now this itself, uh, if developing silo, create barriers for cross-border green capital flows. Because for example, a green bond issue in China uh, may not be recognized in Europe and then the European investors are not buying. And uh, to address this problem, uh, one particular initiative uh, that's been taken, I think is very important, it's called the Common Ground Taxonomy uh, that was uh, uh, initiated by China and Europe back three and a half years ago. And I had the honor to co-chair this working group and we have produced the first version of the Common Taxonomy, which includes 72 climate mitigation activities that are recognized both by China and EU. And now, uh, uh, the capital can flow. We have issued uh, you know, many green bonds from China and put on this label, this is uh, common ground taxonomy aligned and the European investors are buying. So this is just one example of how we can you know, create better green capital flows and this common taxonomy need to be scaled up to include more countries, including Singapore. In fact, Singapore joined just last month into the uh, common ground taxonomy uh, development and in the future it could become a basis for uh, a global, what I call interoperability of uh, sustainable finance uh, taxonomies. The second barrier is a lack of uh, um, internationally sustainable, uh, consistent sustainable reporting um, standards. And that effort is being taken to address uh, this problem, which is ISSP, International Sustainability Standard Board. And uh, they just published their <laughs> reporting standard a few days ago. And uh, going forward, I think uh, we need more countries to adopt it um, so that uh, globally we'll be reporting uh, the same standard with same meaning yeah. and then international you know, fund managers and uh, financial institutions can compare and assess the greenness of different activities using the same standard. Yeah. Minister, I think you wanted to make a point. Yes. Often we would come to meetings like this, exchange ideas, good suggestions and they end up evaporating and no one uh, carry them forward. What we need is a plan of action because a plan of action is what tells us from here what is the way forward. What are we going to do? Who is going to do what? Now you need drivers. For example, in my government, we have the Namibia Investment Promotion Board. This is a driving agency that is able to drive this program, that is able to partner with philanthropists to come in and showcase the projects that we are having, who are the beneficiaries, what are the costs, and how feasible are they? So now when we have a plan of action as to how these drivers are going to reach out to others and popularize what they are doing among others, different countries, different continents, is only when you are likely 
to realize what you want to achieve. That's brilliant. And uh, I want to open the floor for Q&A, but um, I think the clo I would love for you all to think a little bit about what the plan of action should be for your closing thoughts. Um, you're all stakeholders in this. So towards the end, 30 seconds each, would love to know what, how do we translate what we've talked today to actionable content. Um, and so let me first open the floor for Q&A. Um, are there any questions? I think it's a lady there. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Perra with the Bezos Earth Fund. We are a philanthropic organization created by Jeff Bezos that will spend $10 billion this decade to address climate change and protect and restore nature. We also emphasize environmental and climate justice in our work. And I, I really just want to applaud the forum for launching the Gaia Initiative and elevating the value of public-private philanthropic partnerships. We're engaged in a number of these partnerships, and we think it's a very important and underutilized model, especially when it comes to climate and nature, where we know we need to drive change with really extraordinary speed and scale. And that will take powerful collaboration across all of these sectors. So I don't have a question. It's more of a comment. But I really wanted to express appreciation for this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph, I know that you, uh, McKinsey, has been working with VEF as well on Gaia. Would you like to just sort of maybe address that a little bit and talk? Sure. High level. Look, you know, one of the things that we have been trying to do is trying to figure out like how do we channel all this energy right into the highest priority areas. So, you know, I think starting from earlier this year, we had a bit of a, you know, we're McKinsey going to have a framework for everything. So we have a kind of three-step framework to try to prioritize and, and, and channel the energy into a few areas. But the first step what we did was that we did a bit of a scan of um, you know all the things that we actually can do. And think about like what would actually move the needle, right? One of the things that I worry a lot about is that there's so many fragmentation of efforts out there. At the end, if you add it all up, does it actually move the needle? So we looked at like what would move the needle, what's the size of opportunity, right? And what um, and that's, that's the first step. The second step was really try to figure out what are the areas that have the most proximity towards what we call a positive tipping point, right? There are many things that we can do. But there are things that are closer towards a tipping point where things might accelerate. Right? So what are those? And so we have a bit of prioritization around them. And at the end, we thought about, OK, what would be most uh, important right? or, or feasible or, 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 or most appropriate for PPPP to work on? Right? So um, anyway, at the end of all that work, we have about 30 areas that we thought would be high priority, um, prioritized by kind of country lines across sectors and all that. So um, we will publish this later, right? Um, and uh, you know, again, like as, a, as a bit of a thought partner, um, what we do is to um, catalyze a little bit this process, right? But I hope that we'll be picked up by um, other partners, right, to move that forward. But that's kind of what we're doing. Um, but hopefully, right, if we can all channel energy towards these few areas, we have a little bit more of a, uh, a hope Right to, to, to move the needle, which is kind of what we all want at the end. That's great. I think, yeah. Hi, um, yeah I'm Eric from the SMB Global. Actually, SMB Global also has a very big function on the sustainability one. Uh, and also, I'm a big fan of the, uh, Dr. Ma. Uh, from when I studied the Duke Queensland University Environmental Research Center, we studied many uh, renewal re papers from G20 and the Green Finance System, as well uh, green investing principles on the Belarus Initiative. So my question regarding uh, to the topic is, I have two. One is the we did a research that there is a, a, a top. Uh, we found we found that if the ESG performance uh, is higher, there could be a reverse U shape uh, when the investors uh, when, when the corporate have better ESG performance. There is a uh, upping, uh, upping trend on the uh, ESG investing. However, when crossing a turning point, the, the, uh, their investing intention or the shareholder ownership will decrease. It means that whether this is the uh, argument that if the corporate put too much energy or the attention to the ESG performance, they will influence their business activities or their business performance. And my second question is regarding their uh, uh, to uh, consolidate the different uh, ESG disclosure uh, reporting standards like the GRI, SASB, IFAS, uh, etc. And how is the progress of the current status quo? And what's your comment on how to uh, uh, unify all those different international standards, especially under the uh, China want to have our own voices or 
the other countries to have their own uh, geopolitical concerns. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Wang. So maybe um, uh, address your questions quickly. Number one, uh, ESG enhancement effort, is it a cost or is it a benefit in short term and long term? Um, I think uh, uh, definitely in the short term is a cost. You have to do something, right? For example, you need to introduce a system to you know, capture your carbon-related information, and you probably need to spend a lot of time and energy talking to your suppliers and telling them that you supply your carbon number to me so that I can report scope three uh, emission number. So it's a lot of cost involved up front. Uh, but in the medium and longer term, um, the company is going to benefit because uh, with better ESG performance, you will raise money at a lower cost, uh, whether it's from debt market, from banks, and especially from the equity market. And also, your brand name is going to improve, and the more consumers will buy your products. And also, you can avoid a lot of uh, uh, potential you know, legal litigation, you know, reputation costs, which will save you money. But when the benefits come, it's uncertain. Sometimes it's one year, sometimes five years, sometimes <coughs> ten years. Really depends on your horizon of the uh, the boss. That's why I think lengthening the horizon of the digital maker is very important. Uh, if ESG is only decided by a CFO focusing on this year's bottom line, it doesn't. Gonna, it's not going to work. And you have to be really decided at a very high level, at the board level, who will own the company for the next ten years. That's my answer to your question number one. The second one is how to unify the reporting standards. There are so many reporting you know, standards, principles, templates, and so on. I think at least 70 of them globally, and uh, they need to be consolidated. Eventually, I think uh, this uh, basis for consolidation is ISSB. And ISSB just announced their uh, standards a couple of days ago, and I think they're going around the world to convince the regulator to please adopt it in full. And uh, uh, fairly likely, I think Hong Kong will be one of the first movers uh, to adopt ISSB, which will you know, help uh, build capacity among Chinese companies as well, because a lot of Hong Kong-listed companies are Chinese companies. And uh, uh, globally, I think uh, you know, Europe and US are moving in the right direction. Um, I'm not sure if they will call their standards ISSB, but uh, it will be quite similar. And then the big job is to really uh, convince developing country emerging market economies to adopt ISSB. And that's why coming back again to the capacity building yeah. is so important uh, to help them to you know, raise awareness on the need for ISSB and uh, how we can help them to lower the cost of being in campaign, including using digital technology. And uh, uh, finally, uh, making sure that we help SMEs to deal with this reporting challenge with tools. Great. Um, you, one quick reminder, you can also ask questions in Chinese if you like. Um, yes, go for it, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I'm Edward from the Dan Price Foundation. Uh, we recognize uh, ideas, innovative ideas in research and practices that can change education for the future. I'd like to pick up on Dr. Ma's point about developing a common language uh, among countries about what is green and what actions um, countries can take. But I think um, getting philanthropies involved and getting the younger generation involved and to the minister's point about um, then the future generation will then drive market and drive, driving the market will demand actions that companies will have to take to address the issue, collective, with a collective mission. So I'd like to hear from uh, uh, this panelist's point um, about how do we develop this common language, teach them to the younger generation, so then they will drive the demand, then drive the actions that we can all take together. Who wants to go first? Minister, would you like to weigh in? Uh, well, uh, how do we... Uh, can you please just repeat the question again? How do you create that common language? Yeah, how do you create the common language? First, you need a forum. Uh, it can either be an initiative that governments can do. It can either be an initiative that the private sector can do. A forum where you have stakeholders. Now, particularly when you bring in these young entrepreneurs, uh, in this forum, you would exchange ideas. First, you also need to hear from them. What are their needs? What are their challenges? Because their challenges and their needs are not the same as for those that have been in the market for long. They are not the same as those for the government. Now, in this forum that we are creating nationally, a dialogue or whatever you may call it, you, you take it from there 
the suggestions that is coming from these young entrepreneurs is how best you can assist them. Yeah. No, in, in, in many ways, you know, I don't worry as much about the next generation. I think the awareness, the passion, and you know, what they want to do is far better than our generation or whoever generation you, you want to associate yourself with. I do think that the issue um, is not as much as we need to teach them, as much as we can teach ourselves, right? I do think that the people who have the power today, whether it's in government, in corporates, in, who have the resources, um, I, I actually think that the young generation is far more you know, passionate and advanced on these issues than we are. So, um, it's, you know, so I, I think the question is, is reversed. I think that it's less about us teaching them, right? I'm more thinking around the question is, you know, we're talking about this a lot, but how do we then really put real dollars behind it? Because there is a price at the end of everything. And the question is going to be, you know, where's the willingness to pay for it? Um, and so, um, you know, so I, I'm much more positive, right, on, on them, right, in some ways than on ourselves. So we've got three minutes, um, and I think this, well, we can take one last question. Okay, uh, I'm Henk Alving, currently for the Dutch government. I worked for the Obama administration. I want to refer two points for the role of philanthropy. One is referring back to a McKinsey report on 2009, and it was about, and the winner is, really about challenges and prize to up not only the ambition, but really drive <coughs> innovation and partnership. And I think there are a lot of lessons there that we applied with the Obama administration post Hurricane Sandy, for instance, in the rebuilding, where we brought the community together with private sector and government to really up our game on climate action. The second is, it's complex, eh, these issues. And I think philanthropy plays a critical role in creating a safe space. And I think um, this, the continuity of driving that safe space where across the lock-in and the divides and generations and borders and also the different way of accounting and mechanism is of critical importance to be able to achieve something that is beyond the existing system. And we can't innovate with the rules and regulations that we have today. So I think philanthropy can really play a, a great uh, role in one, setting the ambition and with these challenges, and at the same time continue to create a safe space. That's great. Thank you. Very, very interesting point. So 20 seconds each. How do we move the needle? I'm going to start with you, Dr. Ma. Uh, just one idea. Um, I think we need to sort of uh, reject, address this uh, information asymmetry problem between philanthropies and uh, the real economy actors. Um, one particular example is that I run this uh, China Green Finance Committee, which we set up uh, in 2015. And out of the 300 corporate members, we have zero philanthropies. And uh, we were talking about you know, green actions every day, uh, but somehow we're not connected yeah. to the philanthropy. So forums like that and also you know, better connections and communication will be very useful. Yeah. Mm. I would say trust is key to making all of this happen. And that's why we provide this alliance, this trusted platform where people can come together and to that point about a safe space to learn to collaborate and learning together in a safe space is very important because with that, with a common shared purpose, with a sense of collective ownership that we own this, we have got to do this for long-term systemic change. That's where we can get everyone together to look then at innovative models and then, of course, money, despite what you all say about collaboration and all that, money is what has to drive things forward. But with trust, then you get the funders in yeah. to then drive, and particularly from the private sector and the government. Joseph. I think we need leadership now more than any time before, and I do think that leaders got to track their own, what I call the talk to do ratio, right? Some have a very high talk to do ratio, but you got to get to do a bit more. So I think if we can all track that, all have a bit more high ambition, I think we'll, we'll get there earlier. Sabrina? I think it's a mindset change. So for corporates, because we have a stand for the company, so it's very important, not only the philanthropy side, it's your main business, how to integrate your daily commercial operation with social value creation. So we call it due value creation, commercial value and social value. If every company, especially the leading company, they have this mindset, they find the opportunity and use the massive you know, corporate behavior to create a value for the planet. I think that's a key, that's the future. And finally, Minister. From the government, we need a more pragmatic approach to drive the agenda. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. That's it from us. Give a huge round of applause to our wonderful panelists. Thank you.